my name is Lauren Ferrari. I am the Biological and Visitor Center Manager at Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area, which is located in uh, the Lancaster and Lebanon County borders. So I recognize a lot of people here. Um, also just started our own map station there with Dan Mummer, who spoke previously about barn owls. So i um, pretty excited to be surrounded by so many people that are awesome. Um, I am going to piggyback a little bit on uh, Mercy's presentation earlier, which is awesome because I have 23 slides to get through in approximately eight minutes. So I'm going to go as quickly as possible. But a lot of people in here have exposure to American Thestrals, whether you are a volunteer, um, maybe you ban them yourself, maybe you have boxes or you've helped put boxes up. So they're definitely a very charismatic species um, that a lot of people enjoy seeing in Pennsylvania. Um, again, this is a lot of review, but one of 13 casual species in the entire world are one of the three falcon um, uh, species that we have here in Pennsylvania. Variety of things for their diet, as Mercy kind of talked about, and there's their range. Um, but really looking at their habitat needs, including open grass or open landscape, grass and fields, the awful perch sites, nesting cavities, and of course food. Um, but one of the main things that all of us continue to look at here today with a lot of species is the the decline in American petrels is um, following trends of a lot of other uh, critical species and grassland species specifically. So you can see here that uh, the declines are pretty much continual throughout the nor uh, North America. And Mercy covered a lot of these reasons for decline, um, some of which are have a lot. Some of which we can maybe help a little bit easier than others. Um, the, what we're really, I'm really going to focus on today is what the Game Commission has done since 2015 when the American Kestrel was actually added to the State Wildlife Action Plan. Every state uh, agency, in this case the Game Commission for Pennsylvania, is in charge of coming up with a wildlife action plan in order to receive grant funds from the federal government. And these are species of concern that um, we hope that we can give our special attention to. Most of them are non-game species because that's where we see a lot of the declines happening. A lot of species that are game, considered game species um, are doing okay, but some of them could be still indicator species. But the Kestrel in this case, joined, unfortunately joined the ranks of the action plan in 2015, which allowed uh, Dan and I to really, excuse me, focus a little bit more time and attention on them. Um, so if you're familiar with the wildlife action plan, you can look it up online, um, but the uh, Kestrel is, uh, one of the, the critters that is on there and um, Lauren Goodrich from Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, which are some folks here from Hawk Mountain today, put this together. And they've obviously been a huge advocate for, for raptor research, including Kestrel. So in the Southeast region, some of the things we really wanted to focus on just at a, a very uh, grassroot level was increasing those nesting cavities. That's like the number one thing we know we can do to hopefully help them. Snags or dead trees are one of the limiting factors on the landscape. Usually, if you're a landowner, you don't want dead trees on your property. Um, so that's one thing you can increase. Uh, we hope to increase nesting success across the area, engage with the public, and hopefully broader with uh, partner with broader research programs like Hawk Mountain. Specifically in the southeast, where that ring, that red ring is, um, we really wanted to focus on game lands within the southeast that have heavy grassland components, other public land um, and crop of habitat that might have connectivity to other um, sites. And of course, private land since a lot of the Southeast is privately owned. So this is just a brief overview of 2022. I'll get to kind of historical information to now, but this is where we're at now. In the Southeast, we've installed 365 total boxes. Of those, 117 are active. And right down there, the private property and different game lands are there. The one the circled areas are state game lands. So you can see there's clusters in those areas. Uh, and that's where we have a lot of our um, a lot of our uh, most heavily active sites. We really use public help, especially with our private boxes. Uh, Dan's been awesome at kind of getting that together. Um, we have a variety of volunteers. Each of them have uh, a ton of boxes that they monitor for us throughout the year. Over 300 boxes, there is no way between Dan and I that we would be able to do that by ourselves. So we really heavily rely on volunteers to help us with that. But just some cute photos. I know everybody likes the photos here. so. We wait till they're around 14 to 20, uh, 25 days of age till we can ban them. Um, you can see the male and the female there on the left picture. And the guy on the right is just getting close to where we're just not wanting to ban anymore that we risk them pledging prematurely. So, um, but kind of a little bit more about the 
expanding process here. Sometimes the sale trick works, sometimes it's just really not. Um, sometimes we're very fortunate that we can find the adult in the box with chicks. We um, really haven't been too, being, been too aggressive with pursuing this because we don't want to uh, risk nest site abandonment. Um, so we haven't really, that's a very opportunistic um, situation. But for nesting success, we've had 117 boxes used. We see the total number of nestlings banded from those boxes. Um, and this is just from 2022 in that map again. So here's kind of our results for the last 10 years. So um, I know the star there mentions where we had the wildlife action plan. So we had been kind of dabbling in some tester work previously, but you can see this exponential growth over time between boxes um, and of course active nests and then ultimately nestlings banding banded. So pretty cool to see how much we can make, hopefully a difference in a short amount of time. But the title of the talk is Dream Work or Teamwork Makes the Dream Work. Um, and this is just a brief example of all the things that have really come together to help us put those uh, boxes on the landscape. The Game Commission is state funded. Of course, we can help take care of our own state game lands, but we wouldn't have been able to really put the boxes on the private lands without the help of these other uh, organizations, local bird clubs, uh, different school groups, and of course, Eagle Scout projects. So um, a big, big thank you to all those folks that assisted with that. Connecting with the public is a huge thing. Dan and I try to take every opportunity when we are doing these bannings, especially with private landowners, to show them we really appreciate their collaboration. A lot of times these private landowners are the, the same people that are checking the boxes for us and updating us on where they're at in their cycle uh, and if they're ready to be banded. So uh, again, without them, Dan and I are only four eyes. We're, we're only able to get to so many boxes. Um, and I had to put in a little plug for wildlife on Wi-Fi. If any of you are educational folks that like to share information with, with younger people or just the general public, uh, definitely check out the Wildlife on Wi-Fi Hub. Um, our first from the field experience uh, was actually on barn owls and kestrel bandings. So um, it was a little longer. Uh, it was right at the like turn of when it was like May after COVID happened and we really wanted to start getting out in the field to show people what we were doing. Um, but there's other banding opportunities on there uh, to see, such as waterfowl banding, morning dove banding, and uh, northern solid out banding as oh, well. I won't go too heavy into this because Mercy covered some awesome stuff earlier, but um, really on the back side of this, we want to start looking at more questions and we hope our collaborations and the guidance from Hawk Mountain specifically will really help us determine um, what else we can do as a state agency to see how we can continually increase um, nesting opportunities and hopefully the success of these raptors, specifically habitat speaking is what we're really interested in. These sites that we have high, uh, you saw the clusters of the game lands where we have high use. How can we quantify that information and take it to maybe private landowners, but specifically our public land and replicate that so we can encourage uh, American casual use on all those states. Again, more of the wildlife action plan, a lot of information in here, but really Hawk Mountain is, is just a huge driving force for these raptors and we love collaborating with them. Um, and we've been awesome, uh, been privileged to work with Mercy and the team at Hawk Mountain with a lot of these um, opportunities to really hopefully increase kestrel populations and make the habitat better for them around the state. <laughs> I know you got your textural questions answered previously. Um, one thing I will say, you know, if you are a landowner, I will try to speak for Dan a little bit on this too, but if you are a landowner in the southeast part of the state and you know that you've had textuals around and you're interested in um, helping textuals, I know Mercy talked about nest boxes, but we have some available too, and we'd be happy to come out and kind of collaborate with you guys to try to add those uh, to your state. Thank you. Welcome to the and the 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 uh, like this part here, uh, the good form actually starts, because she just allows people, accordingly with their map space, actually, 
plainly. And so I would just like to thank my co-authors on this project, Melissa, Alison, uh, Blake, Shelly, and uh, Lam. And today I'll be talking about um, how we have quantified the results for our map data, or rather the map data, and right there at scratch was preserved. So considering we all know this, we've had this a couple of times, um, there's one in whole breeding bias that I have been lost since the 1970s, and more specifically, this is translating to about 170 million uh, eastern forest birds, as well as 5 billion uh, migratory birds. And so it's very important to quantify vital rates, but also the activity and survival for some for most of these species, just so we can be able to implement management practices that will help with these birds that are declining in numbers. And so we sought to estimate our productivity and a higher survival uh, of songbirds right mm -hmm. here at Rashton Wood Spicer. And we did this using maps data. So where you are, this is Rashton Wood Spicer, and it is located in southeastern Pennsylvania, and most specifically between two major migratory routes. That is the Kitani Ridge in uh, Pennsylvania and the Cape May in New Jersey. And Rashton is about 25 hectares um, preserved that consists of uh, a lot of habitat types. So the forest type where mass stations are located is right here. You have the meadow and the farmland around here, and then you have shrubs that also is a uh, forest or are found within the forest. Um, and the woodland, which is essentially where our map station is located, is about 11 hectares. Um, and it forms part of about 95 hectares um, contiguous woodlands, that is one of the largest remaining uh, and fragmented budget in Western in Fresca and And so we used MAPS protocol, I'm sure. A lot of you here are familiar with the MAPS protocol, where 10, 12 meter net. Um, this net uh, placed in the woodland on those sides. The net right here is a little hard to see, but you can see it's 10 of them. <laughs> um, and the urban area of about 45 kilometers squared, and they're checked every 40 minutes for six hours from Sunday, and as more specifically during summer. And therefore, you get a lot of micrometric data, such as species, the bad species you're collecting, weight, age, wind length, and all those um, various things. Good patches sometimes are placed on the summer. And our specific objective, therefore, was to quantify productivity and current and survivorship in five, in five of the most abundant songbirds that are caught in this area. And so we had the common yellow throats, oven bread, uh, dairy, wood trash, and the ever so majestic red And so for our methods, for productivity specifically, we use generalized uh, linear model. Um, and for this particular analysis, you have the young, the number of young birds specifically had here as the random value variable, here as the predictor variable, and the number of adults captured um, in your model. And for survivorship, we use transient CJS model, and these are essentially capture and capture for this particular data. And so you have sex, we had two groups, you have sex, males and females, and we also have residency, transient or um, a resident bird. And what we consider a, a, a transient bird, uh, or rather a resident bird, if a bird is caught twice in its first year, and this protocol is essentially now how we see, it is considered a resident bird. If it's only caught one, the first year is captured, then it's considered a, a transient bird. It's just passing through. It's one of the assumptions of the model specifically. And so what did we find? Um, we found that for our productivity, also called a, a reproductive, not known as reproductive index, we found that these had the highest reproductive index of about 0.2, 0.02 rather, um, 0.2 rather, uh, followed by Ovenberg that had um, an, a productive index of about 0.1, wood thrushes and grape had 0 0.08 and 0 0.06 respectively. And lastly, the common yellow zone, a negative uh, RI index. And this could be as a result of a lot of things that I'll get to that in a bit. But we see that a lot of our, or a lot of the sweet there is a sort of going up except for the yellow, uh, common yellow zone. And this could point out to the, uh, because we should, I, I personally suspect that it's because the no recapture rate, especially for 
the uh, young birds rather. So I think it's probably because the sample size is too small, which I found to be about 21, could be a lot of other things that are happening beyond um, our scope right now or other things we need to investigate. And so this leads to the unreliability of the coefficient estimate for when it comes to uh, estimating productivity. And then when we go to survival analysis, and I'm only reporting here results, non model results, meaning I do not include any covariates in running the data, so I do not include any weights or um, uh, wing length or uh, a lot of other things. Um, and we found that the highest apparent survival was found in the, was found in open birds rather. And then, uh, and that is at about 0.7. And then for, Common yellow trout and wood thrushes, we found point, about 0.5 uh, for both of these species. And then we also found that various and very catbirds can very moderate survival when it comes to this stream. So, what do we intend to do with this information? I think um, the gist is in the covariate. If you ask me, I think just being able, especially if you have such a long term data set, especially since this was from 2011 to 2021, it's very important. To to be quite interesting to look at other morphometric things or playing around with a lot of covariates such as weight, wing, and type. And we actually see, and we found that the time model, and you can see here, essentially what you do with this sort of data when you're modeling for this data, you, you run a bunch of covariates that you think are of ecological importance, or you think, you know, could be influencing why and how, uh, influencing survival, especially in this case. Um, and then you, you run, those models using AIC, and if, and if, I, if you get a model that is with, with, uh, around or with, within two AIC, which is the Delta AIC here, then it should be a competing model. But you can see there was nothing that came to us, and the time model was very interesting in this case. However, if you look at a certain error here, if when we use the certain error here, something weird is happening here. So it would just be nice to they are around this probably include a couple of weather information. And we actually did very cold and temperature also, and those do not change the order of the models. So it, it would be interesting to play around with that. And so we need to look at, into this to uh, see how we can, how this can inform further management uh, practices with this data. And the most important point is for long-term state studies because this information we can combine with like mortars or check what's happening in wintering grounds to have a bigger picture. But the most fun thing that I found, these two birds here. Yeah. So the top one here is the oldest oven bird on record um, that was caught and abandoned here at Rushton. And the last time I think it was caught it was in 2021, rather 2020, that's the oven. And then this very is the second oldest on record, like 12 years old, and it was last caught right here at Russian Woods. So, so I think this at the end of the day is quite the interesting part. It's good to do the science, but also you know, having an attachment to birds and seeing them right, is also quite interesting. And with that, I'd be happy to take any question. Mm -hmm. um, hi everybody. Uh, so for just a little background on how I got into this, two years ago I was thinking myself, I'm already really into birds, so I'm hopelessly making up the science fiction. A lot of the board games I have at home are so complicated that no one will play them with me. So once I add to this list of qualities that could possibly make my family and friends think I'm an even bigger board. And I'm trying to have to get really obsessed with programming and using machine learning to parse audio for bird song. Um, the real reason I got into this is just kind of like a deep love of bird song itself. When I got into birds, the thing that really kind of pushed me down the rabbit hole even more was listening. And I realized I've kind of taken soundscapes for granted. Um, so studying bioacoustics gave me an excuse to kind of formalize this love. And it turned out to be a pretty incredible field. So for those of you who don't know, sound frequency monitoring involves monitoring my life, but 
Uh, you can cover small areas with a few units, or you can cover entire landscapes. Uh, there's some studies I know about to use thousands of these across entire mountain ranges. And you set them to record a predetermined schedule. I can't talk about all of these, but I think I'm going to discuss some major advantages are by increasing your number of recorders, the length of your recordings, and the number of days you deploy them. You have a lot of control over your suits on temporal coverage. This also in turn increases your detection rate for rare or big species. Um, and when it comes down to this kind of just for a lot lower effort, you get a lot more data. And for a long time, this was actually kind of a weakness because historically there was nothing you could do with all that. You could collect a thousand hours, but if you can't listen to a thousand hours, no one actually can. You just collected a bunch of noise. So being able to automate the process of looking through that is going to be more. And just in the last couple of years, the automated processes have become enough that the plug gets general. And this is like a really vital way to study wildlife populations. So, in the general passive acoustic monitoring program, you've got three phases. Your first phase is the swimming questions and study design. Your third phase is you know, gathering your metrics and hopefully informing some sort of conservation action. Uh, the phase two, which is what I want to focus on, is when you're digging through that map of audio that for the signals of interest. Uh, this almost always involves turning the audio into a visual representation called a spectrogram, which you're probably all familiar with. Um, this is important because people can look at this more easily, but also the models that we have that are best at doing this are actually image classification models. So by turning the sound into a picture, we can leverage the power of these uh, deep learning artificial intelligence models. So in a perfect world, all the birds would take turns when they sing. Sing right back into a recorder. There wouldn't be any humans or rain, and they would sing that like one version of the song that you know. So it's just not enough. In the real world, then we all know that soundscapes are pretty messy places, and especially during the breeding season, there's a lot of repeat sounds. There's wind, rain, uh, dog barking. So the challenge of going through this, like if you have thousands of hours of audio, you actually have thousands of hours of pictures that you need a model to be able to pick up. So your options for doing that are obviously manual annotation, but that takes way too long. Um, and that will just limit your capacity to actually record and take advantage of passive for the strength, which is scale. There's some other things I can't really, don't really have time to get into, but they're a little complicated. Well, it means where the field got to be. And that means image classification. And it uses models called neural networks that are inspired by the architecture of the human brain. And it's kind of cracked the case. Um, so when I was practicing this, my wife told me, you, know, quote, you need to chill out on this slide. But um, I really love thinking about how these models work and building them and talking about how they work. So if you find me later, I'd be happy to. But I'm going to chill out on this slide. The Python is saying that they're really powerful because in the first part of the model, they actually automatically extract features that they find the model finds relevant for classification tasks. There's more access to the classification. Whereas other ways of doing it, you have to kind of manual engineer and extract those features, and you are kind of guessing how uh, the computer knows. Yes. Does anyone know what these songs are? Okay. It's a cardinal. That's why it's been a really fast. In this classification, the repositories, so you can see how if you have a high degree stereotype sound it's actually not that hard for a computer model to be able to increase the size. And for really common birds that are highly represented in the in the data sets online, like the Zeno Canto and the Power Library, it's um, if you had to train the models yourself, studying like this would actually be prohibitively technical, and it takes a long time and a lot of time to train them. These models, like BirdNet, that are getting easier to use, and you can you know, start them and using that scale now. There's really no reason not to use the uh, some more. Um, I use BirdNet in a lot of my studies, but I find that for certain species, it doesn't perform quite as well. And in that case, you can go in and create your own AI models to new species. Um, so metrics you can come up with really easily are species diversity, uh, how it across landscape, like that. Uh, so nice Thank you uh, Okay, so then I'll take a little time. So it's in, I think I'll note here that like, you never fully just taking the models like word and taste value. I think there's something called Merlin called Barking Dog and Warm Turkey. 
So like you have to very good like automated process with some real like um stringent protocols for validation. I didn't validate all 80,000 swap square protections because I'm pretty sure that it was probably this one is small stupid. Um, but I validated some set to get an idea for like one is for net prep, one is a long one is top less there. But then for like stranger detections, like record of woodpeckers or conductive warblers, you can go in and actually validate all of those. And instead of going through 1,000 hours to find this, you have to only have to sit through um, five minutes. Occupancy modeling is another really powerful way that you can use acoustic data. Uh, it's based off presence, absence data alone. And um, for studying cryptic birds, like one of my projects, I was looking at the Virginia Rail. Occupancy modeling is great because it accounts for interrupt detection. So just because one of my reporters didn't hear a rail doesn't necessarily mean the rail wasn't there. It just means that either it wasn't there or I didn't hear it. So by using occupancy models are great. Environment. Yeah. Um, these are also very cool. This is not. And I'm like, I get a hundred of names together for this presentation, and I heard of the bioacoustic index and how that maps with species diversity, which is the implications of this. You could kind of do rapid ecological assessments just with soundscape data alone. But it's completely species diagnostic. It's just a calculation that lists the diversity of species and often by the case. The holy grail of acoustic monitoring is being able to figure out how many birds are actually there. And there's a lot of really cool ways. Again, I'd love to talk more about them. Um, what it comes down to is trying to figure out something about the individuals in the reporting. And there are a lot of ways that people have done this successfully. So some projects that I'm working on now, I guess I'll just talk about one. Um, John Hines Wildlife Review is doing a really big restoration project. And they want to use acoustics to down a medium community baseline data. Like marsh birds and with acoustic monitoring, you can really easily just make sure that the project is come along and kind of use the metrics as a measurement of success. So, with that, I'll Yeah, that's work. Okay, so you can use Bergman, you can have a class one species. It will still give you like 10,000 detections, of which only maybe a couple hundred will be correct. Okay. But that still changes a thousand hours into 20 hours. Yeah. There are a lot of artifacts you can use for different things. I think Python is kind of for building deep learning models is where it's at. But uh, right now, BirdNet, you can actually run with just really minimal script. You can run it through Python, but it really just does it in here. Also, it'll give you the CSV. Um, and then you can use like whatever artifact if you like, so then go through that CSV. Yeah. Cool. The afternoon is Brad Brown from um, Hot Rock Sanctuary. So we'll talk about mineral vultures. And some slides will be brought to you later. I'll provide an insight into the natural history. Everyone can hear me just fine, right? Don't need a microphone. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm glad I managed to make it in here. I uh, have a long history with Willis Town. It's been been putting up with me for over 12 years now, I think. Always nice to be down here seasonally. I head up uh, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Farmland Raptor Program that's targeting our four grass and species. And then I'm a co-lead on our New World Vulture Project. Come up to the lookout during migration season. You'll see me up there as well. But today I'm going to try to pare down my love of vultures into a quick update on our auxiliary wing uh, tagging project what our findings have been so far and how it's a phenomenal flagship approach at engaging uh, public 
with research and it's an easy introduction to a very slippery slope and a love of the species. So today when I say new world vultures, uh, we have some collaborations with some of our other seven species uh, found in the new world. But today I'm mainly gonna be talking about these two, black vultures and turkey vultures. A lot of the talks today have been on declines, depressing trends. I'm here to say these guys are doing fantastic. Uh, Partners in Flight has an estimate of 190 million uh, black vultures uh, across the range. You can see they have a quite an expansive range. They are equatorially centric with the uh, densest populations for Central America and Northern South, but they've been doing a rapid uh, range expansion, especially here in the Northeast, uh, they are considered a near commensal uh, species. They're more than happy to watch what we're doing and take advantage of the excess. Um, and they uh, had a population increase trend of about 3.4 to 3.8 percent annually. Um, so that's a phenomenal growth rate, uh, especially for a new world vulture species. Turkey vultures have the largest home range of any vulture species in the New World. They're only at 28 million estimated. Uh, here in the East, we have a partially migratory population, which means we get to enjoy turkey vultures year round. Um, similar to the black vultures, they're showing up further and further north each season. Uh, as friends with each other's work. Up on the Hudson Bay, they had turkey vultures there for the first time just two years ago. So both species are doing very well and they're well suited for taking advantage of things like roadkill, carcass dump, landfills, um, dumpster diving behind McDonald's. They know where the food's gonna show up. And being a generalist species, they're willing to explore any potential food source and take advantage. So after that, why on earth are we spending time and money to study these increasing populations? So being obligate scavengers, vultures are unique in that they are the largest vertebrate scavenging species in the world. Um, so they're an important ecological function to our ecosystem. And as sort of the end of the food chain, they're a great bioindicator of the health of the ecosystem. So anything that dies in the environment, Vultures are probably going to come by and sample it, and the uh, bioaccumulation will sort of end with that population. Uh, last year, with the HPAI outbreak, black vultures especially were hit particularly hard with large die offs of their communal roosts, um, and we're currently uh, developing some post research at uh, the spread of avian influenza between turkey and black vultures because there are some disparities between the two populations. Um, and then vultures were sort of overlooked. So in 1976, there was a paper published noting that their lovely habit of uh, urohydrosis, which is where they defecate on their legs, which helps with cooling, the high uric uh, acid content in their feces also can serve as sort of an antibacterial when you're wading around in carcass. Um, isn't good when you put aluminum leg bands in. So uh, when bird banding got popular, vultures were being banded, but that uh, ceased around 1980. And after that, there was a couple studies uh, using wing tags, but for the most part, they went overlooked. So we have some general questions as far as what's driving the population trends. What is the distribution and uh, land use of the species, both regionally and across the range? And also there's always the conservation concern. When you're a scavenger, anything that gets into the environment, you're gonna ingest, um, which means poisoning can be, uh, it's a normal problem. And at the time we started this project back in 2008, uh, the old world vulture species were in flats. Some of the more famous, like the white grump, were considered uh, so common it wasn't worth studying. Uh, there's a lot of records of they were just everywhere in India. And then the population collapsed. And in the course of about 10 or so years, um, the ma majority of white um, 
property culture to disappear from the landscape. Now we don't have a great understanding for what the population um, use was across their range. So we're trying to save the species while building some of these natural histories. So a uh, great uh, reminder that uh, just because it's common doesn't mean we should overlook it. Uh, in, in Asia and the Indian subcontinent, uh, with cyclophenic uh, caused acute regional failure in vultures that were eating a cheap, a cheap veterinary drug. Um, and then in Africa, those population declines uh, while similarly dramatic, were mainly due to uh, secondary poisoning or poachers trying to convert his tracks, and the vultures paid the price there because they're really good at identifying a potential meal and showing up to clean. So it's overall fairly grim, with 14 of the 23 uh, vulture species are threatened with extinction. And in the New World, of course, there's the California condor. Um, and the Andean condor population is uh, not, didn't come as close to extinction, but they're uh, trending down. So definitely worth keeping an eye on. And we have some fairly broad questions that we're trying to uh, provide information, such as survivorship, mortality rates, uh, basic breeding biology. When does the vulture initiate uh, nesting? Does it try to nest every season or does it take one off, uh, what portion of the habitat they're using, which portions are peace and success, migratory routes, um, and exchange between breeding versus non-breeding grounds. And it was great seeing some other people mentioned, but our founder, Rosalie Edge, a woman ahead of her time, uh, said, you know, the time to detect species is while she'll come in. You don't want to be trying to play tag tag. So when we initiated the project, we uh, took the step to make sure that it was a very broad scope from across the range. So these are four main avenues for tracking New World vulture populations. There's the counts at the migration watch sites. Uh, we do, we have 23 uh, roadside survey regions from the of South America, Falkland Islands, all the way up into Canada. Um, those we try to visit every 10 years to just get a general trend of what the scavenging community is uh, doing in the region. Um, I'm currently wrapping up our second round on those, so stay tuned for a future update. And then the two aspects I'm going to talk about today is satellite telemetry, which allows you to track an individual bird, versus the wing tagging, which again, uniquely uh, identifies an individual, um, but is much cheaper. So with vultures, I promise not to regurgitate pull a vulture on you guys. To get them in hand, you have to bait them with something. That means don't stand downwind of meter this much. Um, we employ two methods. We either uh, use the walk-in trap where you can catch an entire feeding group, or we'll stake out new slimes, which is over on the right. That's a simple monofilament uh, line attached parachute cord that is staked around the carcass. Um, and, and then you sit down and wait. Vultures, being a highly intelligent species, can make it quite challenging. I've had them pick mooses, uh, clothes, step in, drag carcasses out. So it's a battle of the wills, and I can't guarantee that I'm more intelligent than the vulture. Um, but ideally, when you get them in hand, uh, we can't put a physical leg band on the vultures, uh, like bassoons. So they get air banded. Both species are a size eight, which just means each one has its own nine digit code that the bird range lab will use. But they're identified through the uh, wing tag. So that uniquely numbered uh, tag is unique to the individual. Extracting them from the trap can be exciting. Uh, when you start extracting the birds, they're relatively easy. Try to stick their heads through the snap of many material. Get away, you can get control of the head, and like other diurnal raptors, the vulture, you have to control the head first. That's the business end. Uh, they're in the business of removing flesh. Your forest target does matter. Um, then, once you scoop up the legs, the most important thing you do is tilt your vulture and empty it. They regurgitate what they just consumed. Uh, you don't really want to see a maggot come back up. 
Um, but once that's done, we can process the birds, uh, hive tech, newspaper, mailbox, make a phenomenal um, tube. Put the slit in the side so we can access the wings. This means two people can quite comfortably process the brood. Um, and then we'll pin it by putting the tubule tag and release it back out into the environment. Uh, depending on the study, we might pull a blood sample to check for pollutants. Um, we were doing a lead study. We found about a little over 50% of our population were clinical, uh, with uh, nestlings being uh, the most variable age group, with some being completely clean as far as lead exposure, with, and some being clinical. So a lot of variability. But again, if you know where the scavenger's been, you can uh, get nesting for the system in. So want to show our transmitter slide. So at this point, we have an excellent database with 86 transmitter turkey vultures. Um, with most of our units for microwave, we're switching over to CTT. Uh, looking forward to each getting another one for Vermont uh, this season. But the data plan can get quite pricey. Our longest transmitter was 12 years that we were paying the data bill on. And of course, that was a non migratory bird. So, set on for our local movements. But this should sort of the expanse of areas we visited, either personally or through collaborators. Um, East Coast birds, about 50% of our population was non migratory, which meant they spent uh, the entire year in the rough geographic region. Um, some were migratory some years and non migratory following. And then once we go across the Mississippi, all of those become obligate migrants where they move uh, to a distinct region for the wintering period, except for our uh, southern Arizona population, there were a couple individuals that were not migratory. Um, and that was tied to uh, dairy farm circus piles. Um, again, predictable, but nice coverage. Uh, downside with transmitters is the price. So 86 individuals, um, you can rack up some data plans. Um, I did bother to create a um, map for all of our black vulture transmitters because each individual pretty much looks like this. They spend the entire year roughly in the same geographic region. Most birds will occasionally do these sort of exploratory winter flights, um, especially if uh, snow depth got uh, above eight inches and it stayed below um, 40 degrees for like three weeks. Most of our black vultures will move south a little bit um, a lot went into redding, um, presumably for the thermal benefit. But again, uh, species back at the range map, uh, the entire uh, map is purple. They're considered non-migratory. So that's an intriguing question, especially given their rapid range expansion. And at the northern edge of the range, those birds disappear during the winter. So uh, it's a cautionary tale. Uh, hot counts don't always like to uh, count black vultures because they can be very challenging. They'll sail past you headed south at altitude, and then 30 minutes later, you see the name, same number of individuals coming back in the yard. But it's worth keeping your eye out, and this is where the wing tug uh, really benefits because now we can track the individual in real time. And the great alternative is rather than spend about $5,000 a year on data per individual, five stocks gets you a wing tag this individual. You can get a lot more uh, individually marked. And the nice thing about this is you don't have to lay your hands back on the vulture to track it as it goes by with daily distance. Um, for you songbird people, you languish in about 1.5% uh, re-encounter rate. Raptors with their larger bodies is up at 4%. Back when we were banding turkey vultures on the leg, it was about a 6% re-encounter rate, mostly through mortality events. Um, and then wing tagging, well, we'll get into business, but 
this is a fantastic community engagement because when you ask someone what the goal parents, everyone can expect to go out their back door. There's turkey vulture, they all know what it looks like. Fantastic for engaging school kids at the lookout. And these tags really stand out. Uh, the original model was just a livestock cattle ear tag. Uh, we switched to the soft vinyl material that has the top and the bottom wraps around the leading edge of the wing in the potato region. Um, we can uh, use alcohol to clear the feathers out of the way so you can see where the veins are, stay away from the tendon at the leading edge of the wing. So you're not impacting mobility, lays flat as the bird is flying, they're landing next to no mass. And we haven't seen any negative impacts as far as other birds targeting the tag. Um, black vultures are a little rougher on their tags than the turkey vultures. A lot of them will pick at the material and over the course of four to five years, suddenly the leading edge of the tag is ripped off and eventually it will wear and tear. But uh, we have one bird that has a 13 year old tag that's still legible, got a report of it uh, back in December. So they provide you a good period of the bird's life that you're able to track it. And where the first Google search result, when you say wing tag vulture, that mountain sanctuary pops up. Um, I just got a report of a wing tag vulture in Peru. Closest we've uh, tag vultures was down in Bariloche, Argentina. So they work wherever they are in the range. So through uh, 2021, one of our uh, goals was to assess survivorship and whether this was working. So we're now at a little over 1,600 uh, reciting events uh, representing uh, from population of 369 tag black vultures, uh, turkey vultures and um, 1,120 black vulture sightings. And you can see from the transmitters, uh, this is for the light blue, which is turkey vultures, partially uh, migrant species. We get a good uh, re-encounter rate from across the area they are expected to be moving, with most of our black vulture sightings uh, occurring much closer to the trap location. So it works as far as re-encounter rates. Then we wanted to analyze uh, survivorship. So we use the program MARC. Um, and it turns out turkey vultures with their larger dispersal from the trap area, um, we didn't have enough reciting events to actually come up with a survival rate for the hatchier and adult population. But black vultures, we definitely did. So we found that hatchier birds are about 78% survival rate compared to most raptors where it's an estimated 70 to 80% mortality event. They're doing quite well. Um, and then when you look at the adult population, it's 87% uh, annual survival rate. They're doing very well. The age record from a banded black vulture was down in Louisiana, I think, and it was 25, just over 25 years. In captivity, they lived up to 40 years. So this is a long-lived species that is annually, at least typically attempting to put out offspring every season. So it's much more resilient than something like a condor where it's one offspring every couple of years. But the uh, average recites per tag um, and just reciting rate. So remember banded passerines, 1.5%. Uh, we get 64% re-encounter rate with the tag turkey vultures and 77% re-encounter rate for the black vultures. And that's just phenomenal for building a database. And again, this is species specific. Um, you wouldn't want to put uh, wing tags on something like an owl that's nocturnal and hiding during the day. There's no reason to do so. But for a species like vultures, especially with sunning themselves in the morning, they present the tags quite readily and they're quite comfortable around people. So it's an easy engagement to build a lot of data. 
Um, and the tags are an effective means for sort of uh, rebuilding the natural history. So again, the new turkey vultures are partially migratory. So if you look at the mean distance from the trap site, um, black vultures basically are homebodies. Their uh, re-encounter were about 45 um, from where they were located. Uh, whereas turkey vultures, it was 105. Uh, including the entirety of the range. So um, this massive population expansion is getting black folks, especially into trouble as they move into new locations. It's new challenges. People get upset when they invite themselves into your backyard, queue up pets for food. Um, I had a lady that was feeding stray cats. Thought it was funny when two black vultures showed up when she had 55, sitting on uh, waiting for the cat food. That was a problem. I said, take the cat food away. That wasn't an option. So she uh, compromised and began feeding the cats in a shed with a little pet door. I said, you know, if you're going to do that, don't let the vultures see. Within a day, the vultures were going through the cat door. <laughs> yeah. That uh, error, but there's a lot we're doing to get the cattlemen involved. Feel free to become a part of the flock to support vultures. I'm happy to talk vulture at any time. So flag me down. Um, if you see a tag, please report it. We have an online report form. And for any young career people, we have a phenomenal traineeship program at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. So please check it out. Talk to me. Get involved. And I look forward to seeing you in the field at some point.